All right, well, so today's lesson, we're going to look at how we represent bonds between different kinds of atoms. So in this case, we're going to look at a few different things. One is going to be sort of a graphical way that we represent that. And number two is kind of the theoretical way that where do these things come from. So we're going to kind of start back with electron configurations and identifying valence electrons because that's kind of the basis for everything. And then I'm going to teach you how to draw or reteach you how to draw some simple, super simple shortcuts called Lewis diagrams that you'll like once you get used to those. And we're going to be able to use Lewis diagrams and configurations to be able to predict things like ion charges and then figure out how we can use those ion charges to represent ionic bonds and then covalent bonds, which is the very last bit, um, and including... Uh, how we draw pictures of simple molecules. So this is kind of where we're going today. Uh, you'll probably want to have a piece of uh, scratch paper, maybe in a pencil, if you want to kind of draw along with some of these. Probably a periodic table close by as well, and that'll make your make your learning process a little bit a little bit better. Okay, so here we go. Uh, for review, um, we need to kind of think about electron configurations. Um, you can start with orbital diagrams. You can start with electron configurations. Uh, you can start with uh, noble gas shortcut. Don't really care. Uh, but your first goal here is to be able to write electron configurations for these five elements that I have here. And I'm just talking about their element form. Don't worry about if they're an ion or anything like that. Just their regular electron con uh, configurations. Now is a really good time to hit pause. See if you can write those out. And I'm going to continue for, with, you know, with my narration here in a second. And we're going to use those electron configurations configurations to draw Lewis structures. Okay, so electron configurations. Here's how I would write those out, see if my pen will cooperate today. Um, the electron configurations for sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. And again, that's because sodium is in the first column of the third row, so it ends in s1. The next thing that we need to be able to do um, going along with this is, actually, I'll just go down the row first. Magnesium, 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p6, there it is, 3s2, it's right next to sodium, so it's got two electrons in the s energy level. Our nitrogen's a little bit smaller, it only has seven electrons to deal with, so it's 1s2, 2s2, and it's in the p group, second row, and it's in the third column, so it ends in a 2p3. Fluorine's closer to the end of that row, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And then neon is right next to fluorine at the end of the row. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to learn how to draw this little shortcut thing um, that allows us to kind of really abbreviate uh, electron configurations. The key with electron configurations is remembering that when we're talking about bonds, the only electrons we care about is the ones on the outside. The valence electrons are the only ones that are involved in any sort of chemical bonding, and they're in the highest number energy level. So when we look at an electron configuration, we can look at what those valence electrons are. So sodium has one valence electron. Magnesium here has two valence electrons. Nitrogen's a little bit trickier. Nitrogen has a total of, let's see, there's two there and three there. It's five valence electrons uh, by the time it's done. We're talking about fluorine. That's the last energy level, energy level number two. It has a total of two and a total of five is a total of seven valence electrons. And then for neon has a total of eight valence electrons. So this is the important part because these are the number of electrons that could be involved in bonding, either gaining, losing, or sharing. So when we're going to draw these little Lewis structures, they're super nice. I really, really like these. We start off by writing the symbol of the element like that. So there's just an Na for sodium. And then we draw dots to represent the electrons themselves. Sodium has one S electron, so I'm just going to draw a single dot for it, and that's what it would look like. That's a valence electron uh, that we're drawing that single dot. We don't care about all the other ones, uh, the 1s2 and the 2s2, 2p6, because they're not going to be involved in bonding. So magnesium, again, you write the symbol for the element, Mg, and then you put dots for the, um, the valence electrons. In this case, there's two valence electrons, and I'm going to put them both together since they're paired up in that S orbital. For nitrogen, all right, nitrogen is going to be a little bit more challenging. There's N for nitrogen. We've got a total of five valence electrons, so we've got the two S electrons, and notice how I'm putting those together over there on the three o'clock position, and then we have three P electrons, and they are spread out like that. And again, if you remember correctly, it's because way back when we were drawing orbital diagrams, we would draw them like this, P1, P2, and P3, and that would be the two P orbitals. So that's why I have them drawn sort of spread out in that particular shape. They're not all bonded together. When we draw the one for fluorine, fluorine's going to look like this. We've got our two S electrons, S1 and S2. And then for our Ps, you should probably hit pause and see if you can figure out where they're going to go yourself. For the P's, we're going to have one, two, and three. 
then they're going to start to pair up four and five. So that's the Lewis dot diagram for fluorine. And again, when we draw the orbital diagram for fluorine, when we draw those two Ps, there were one, two, and three. And then they started to pair up. There was number four and number five. So we're sort of representing that in our diagram. Over here, when we take a look at what we've got going on in this spot, that pair of electrons is up here. This pair of electrons is over in the left in the 9 o'clock spot. This single electron is down here kind of in the 6 o'clock spot. And those two right there, remember, those are the S electrons, so we have, I haven't drawn those in my orbital diagram. All right, moving on. Neon, last one we've got on our particular page here is neon. Uh, and neon, if you can figure this one out, it's got 1s2 to, or 2s2, and then it's got our Ps, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and P6. So I'll draw that in a little tighter. So there you go. There's neon. Neon's got all four pairs of electrons all the way around. So this is how you draw Lewis structures. Lewis structures are really straightforward. They always have the symbol for the element in the middle. And then around the outside, depending on where you're going to draw them, is going to be your valence electrons. S electrons always go in that three o'clock position. And then the P electrons, if there are any, go in around on the other corners. So again, you draw them if they're paired or unpaired around the edges. So there's kind of a nice thing, once you start to kind of get the hang of these, I'll let you uh, kind of do it long ways, but there's a nice periodic table pattern uh, when we're dealing with these. Everything in this first column right here, remember if this is the S1 electron configurations, every one of these is going to have a Lewis dot diagram that looks like that. These guys were all in the S2 column, so every one of these is going to have an electron dot diagram that looks a lot like this, where you've got, sorry, I know it's hard to draw my little dots here, X with two dots next to it. Over here, this set was our set of p orbitals. And when we're drawing Lewis dot diagrams for this, we're going to draw the same kind of thing where we're going to draw our central element like this, and they're going to have our two s electrons to it because those are already there. And then when we get to the boron column, these guys, they have a single p electron. So that's what they're all going to look like in the boron, aluminum, gallium, etc. They all have three valence electrons. When we get to carbon's group right here, they're going to have that fourth electron. There's P1 and P2. When we get to nitrogen's group, they're going to all have five dots, and they're going to look like that. And again, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about nitrogen or whether we're talking about phosphorus or whether we're talking about arsenic. Any of those are going to follow the same kind of pattern. So by the time we get over to oxygen, this group right in here where we're doing these guys, this is where we're talking about oxygen ends in a P4. So again, it's going to have one, two, three. So there's our first, second, and third P electrons. And then we have to make the spot for our fourth one, and that's where it's going to start to pair up. So everything in that has a total of four P electrons, or a total of six dots. Fluorine's group right there is going to have its fifth P electron, a total of seven dots. And then helium's group, which is actually not really helium, but neon on down, they're all going to have eight dots to them like that. So what's really nice is that you can actually count the columns. These guys all have one. I'm writing at the bottom of the periodic table. These guys all have two dots. Uh, boron's group all has three dots. This group has four, five, six, seven, and eight dots, which is kind of nice when you're trying to figure out how they draw. These guys in the middle, all of these guys right in here, these will all have two dots as well. Um, we won't really deal with those, what we're, we're doing here, but they all have two dots because they all have uh, two S electrons that are filling up. So don't stress about that. The nice part is this other part of the pattern where you're talking about this piece right here, uh, where you're talking about this number system that you've got, where'd it go? There it is, that one right there. The number of the column is the number of the dots. So first column's one dot, second column's two dots, moving over to the P block, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight dots. Nice shortcut. Okay, so we're going to be using these to now predict ion structures. So for you, take a second right now, grab a periodic table, hit pause, and draw the Lewis dot structures for each one of these elements. Some of them we've already done, so you can look back if you want to. Some of them we haven't done. But grab a periodic table, and don't cheat, uh, see if you can figure out what their, um, what their dot pattern would be. Okay, I'm back. So for me, here's the Lewis dot structures. Potassium is going to have one dot. Calcium is going to have two dots. Aluminum over in the P block is going to have three dots. Carbon is going to have one, two, three, and then four dots to it every single time. Nitrogen is going to have five dots. It's in the fifth column. One, two, three, four, and five like this. Sulfur is going to have six dots. One, two, three, four, five, and six like that. Fluorine is going to have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Make that one a little bit bigger. Seven. And then neon is going to be like this total of eight dots all the way around, like that. There we go. 
maybe making these a little bit bigger to make them more visible. All right, so we can use these now to figure out what kinds of ions that they're going to form. The key here is the rule of eight. Every type of, um, every type of atom wants to have eight valence electrons. Um, eight valence is stable. Ooh, if I could write. But the magic number is eight. So eight is the big number that we're going to go for. So electrons are either going to gain or lose um, depending on what they want to do. Well, what they want to get. So if you have a relatively small number of electrons, like these guys right here, they only have one or two, it's going to be a lot easier for those to lose a couple of electrons and drop down to an empty valence shell. If they have a bunch of electrons, like these guys over here on the right, um, these guys are going to gain some electrons to fill up. So they're going to gain to fill, or they're going to lose to empty, one or the other. And it just depends on which one's easier for them. So our friend potassium here, its job if you take a look at what it's got, potassium here has got one electron to it. It could either gain seven electrons to try to fill all of these up, or it could get rid of the one that it has. And so it turns out that it's actually much easier for it to get rid of the single electron that it has. If it just makes that one go away, sorry, like that, and erases it, it now looks like this, where it's potassium with a plus one charge. And that makes it so much easier. Same thing for calcium. You take a look at calcium right here. It's got two electrons. Is it going to try to gain six more to fill up, or is it going to get rid of the two that it has? That turns out that it is going to get rid of two, and it's going to do this, get rid of them, and it becomes calcium as a two plus charge because it's getting rid of two electrons. Um, moving along, aluminum. You might be able to anticipate what aluminum is going to do here. Aluminum is going to get rid of the three electrons that it has. It's going to get rid of that one, that one, and that one. So it becomes Al with a three plus charge. I'll come back to carbon in a second. Let's take a look at our other friends over here on the other side. So those are our three right there that are really good examples of ones that like to lose electrons and they become cations. If we take a look over here at nitrogen, sulfur, and fluorine though, they have a little bit of a different circumstance. They're trying to get eight, but they're already over half full. So they might as well just gain a couple of electrons to fill up their empty spots. So fluorine over here is gonna gain one more electron. And when it does that, it becomes the fluoride ion. So when I draw this, however, I want to make sure that I'm representing all of those electrons in there because it truly has all eight all the way around it. So that's fluoride ion down there. How about sulfur? Well, sulfur is only missing a couple of spots. It's got six of the eight that it wants, so it's got a spot there and a spot there. So it's just going to fill those up. It's going to have an extra electron there and an extra electron there by the time it's done, and that becomes sulfide ion like this and it has two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, and it is a charge of two minus because it's gained two electrons. Nitrogen, over here, our friend, it's got three spots that it wants to fill up, so it has one, two, and three like there that it wants to fill up. So again, it is gonna be nitride ion, which is a three minus charge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I think one of my dots didn't show up, there it is. Carbon's kind of a funky one. Carbon's got uh, a total of four dots. I'm going to draw it down here in the center. Carbon is one, two, three, or four. It actually has two different options. Carbon can either get rid of the four that it has and become a four plus, where it just gets rid of them, or it can fill up all of those spots like this, gain four electrons, and become a four minus. That's why we say a lot of times carbon is plus or minus four. So there you go. If it's a metal over here on the left side of the periodic table, typically they're going to get rid of one, two, or three electrons and become a plus one or a plus two ion. They always have square brackets around them. They always have charges next to them, and they're always naked. There's no electrons remaining because they've given electrons away. On the right side of the periodic table, we've got these guys, nitrogen, sulfur, and fluorine. These are going to gain those last couple of electrons that it needs. You show all eight of the dots. You show the square brackets around it, and then you give it a charge so that it, you see that it's on there. And what about neon? We didn't talk about neon at all. Well, the magic number is eight, so it already has eight. Neon is stable. Neon does not form ions. It just doesn't chemically react. That's why it's a noble gas, because it just isn't friends with anybody else. So how can we use these? So let's take a look at representing bonds between different things. So we're going to take a look at lithium and fluorine. How do these two bond together? Well, I'm going to start by drawing lithium. Lithium looks like this in its Lewis structure. And then fluorine, I'll draw it in a different color, looks like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So when we bind these together, you can see fluorine needs to gain one electron. Lithium needs to get rid of an electron. They're super happy. All that needs to happen here is that this electron from lithium needs to come over here and join fluorine. And once it does that, then they're both happy. This is called an ionic bond. Lithium becomes a cation. 
it gives away its one electron. Fluorine becomes fluoride with all eight of it dots, and it becomes happy that way. And that is now a, a, an ionic bond, basically. We draw them as ions, so they've got to have their square brackets around them on each side. So, well, I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, square brackets around each side like this. So square, square. One of them is shown that it's given away its electrons. One is shown that it's gained an electron. It's got all eight, and we show their charges there. So up with calcium and sulfur. Your turn. Draw Lewis dots for these, and then show me how they're going to bond together. Okay, calcium has two dots. Sulfur has six dots, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So you can kind of see that this becomes a happy kind of a combination. One of those is going to go over here and kind of join up that direction, and the other one is going to go here in this particular spot and join that direction. So calcium is going to give away two, and sulfur is going to gain two. So calcium is going to look like this, calcium. If it's giving away two, it's going to be a two plus. Sulfur is going to be the anion, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dots, and it's a two minus, and that's a perfect match. Okay, the last one, potassium and oxygen, a little bit harder to, get, to draw this one out, so go ahead and see if you can figure out what their Lewis dot structures are. Potassium, that's one dot. Oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So if you take really close a look at this, what would be really nice is that potassium is going to give it away, which is perfect. Oxygen's almost happy, and that potassium is definitely happy. So potassium is going to form a K plus ion. But our oxygen isn't quite happy yet. It would be really perfect if there just happened to be another calcium that would come along. What am I saying calcium? That's potassium. If another potassium came along and donated one more electron, because it's not quite happy yet. So what we'll find here is instead of just being one K, there's actually going to be a second K. A second potassium will come along and donate its electron over there. So what we get is this kind of a formation. Oxygen needs to gain two electrons. So we'll gain one from each particular, sorry, that's two different dots, one from each. And then there's going to be a second calcium that's going to snuggle up. Potassium, why do I keep saying that? Oh my gosh. Um, I keep saying the K. Um, so we've got two different potassiums. Oh my God, shoot me. Uh, two different potassiums right here. Each is donating one electron to fill up oxygen. And so yes, we will get formulas that look like this. And that's why the formula for potassium oxide is K2O. This one's LIF as an as a, a ionic compound, and this one's CAS. So again, representing Lewis dot diagrams and using those to figure out ionic bonds. Again, we're going to draw them like this with our square brackets. Remember that it's okay to have more than one because we have lots of formulas that have subscripts to it. This is how we show those subscripts. We just have more than one particular thing there. The magic number is still eight. These guys have to get rid of everything. These guys have to gain to be full. Okay, one last bit. Okay, so the last slide we were looking at ionic bonds, but we happen to know that there's this whole other kind of bonds, covalent bonds. Not everything gives and takes uh, electrons away. Sometimes there's this really important part called sharing, right? Sharing is caring, uh, and molecular uh, molecular compounds really like to share with one another. And certain compounds like to build this way rather than giving and taking. So let me take a look at these couple of examples that are on here. So we've got chlorine gas, water, and uh, SBr2, which is something I know you don't know the name of. It's uh, mono monosulfur. Now it'd be sulfur dibromide. Um, so. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to draw these dots in a little bit out of order here, so don't kind of panic about how I'm drawing this. But let's draw chlorine like this. Chlorine's got seven electrons to it. And again, I know I'm kind of drawing these in a funky spot, but I know how this is going to work. So there's chlorine. Chlorine's got seven electrons. It's definitely not happy. It needs to gain one, somehow get an extra spot for that. Well, if I have another chlorine nearby, then these guys also have seven. Three, four, five, six, and seven. And if somehow these um, two electrons that are kind of drawn right in the middle here, those could be shared between the two chlorines, then we could say, hey, this is counts for this chlorine, and these would count for this chlorine. And this is exactly what happens. These form a covalent bond. So I'm, gonna, I'm kind of coloring over like that. And that drawn like a line like that means that we're going to indicate that that particular pair of electrons has a special status. It's called a bonded pair now, and it's being shared between the two different chlorine, uh, chlorine atoms. And this is now a molecule. They're stable together um, and actually fairly happy with one another because of the fact that they're both sharing this central pair. So this thing right here is the central pair that locks these two together. This thing right now is called a molecule because they have to stay together in order for each of them to be happy. This one has eight. There's two, four, six, and that counts as the eight. And then this one counts as eight as well, two, four, six, 
and then this is eight for this chlorine over here. So this is a covalent bond where they're sharing. Let's take a look at H2O and how H2O works out. I'm going to start with drawing the oxygen because I happen to know that's in the middle. Oxygen has a total of six electrons too. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now wouldn't it be nice if something came along that just happened to have an electron that it could share? I don't know, like hydrogen. And I don't know, like maybe another hydrogen. This is a shared pair. This right here is a bond and this right here is another bond between those guys. Hydrogen doesn't want to just give it away. It doesn't want to be a totally naked proton out there. So when I finish drawing this structure out, it's going to look like this, H, O, and H. I still need to draw these unshared pairs that are up here. Those don't get to just disappear. So I need to make sure that I'm drawing all of those. And that right there as I've drawn, this is a water molecule. If you take a look at this, this oxygen right here is happy. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight electrons to it. And each hydrogen is happy too, because that counts as the two electrons that hydrogen needs. And for down here, this hydrogen has the two electrons that it needs as well. So you can try it, it's a challenge, but see if you want to try to draw that SBr2 down at the bottom. It's a single sulfur and two bromines together. See if you can figure out how they would happily join up to make a partnership. Sulfur's in the center, and bromines are bonded to the sulfur, by the way. See if you can do it. Okay, sulfur. Looks like this. It has one, two, three, four, five, and six electrons to it. Bromine has seven. So bromine has one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And you can see how that extra seventh one that bromine has makes a perfect bond for that one that sulfur is missing, Br, sorry. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, like this. So we've got a bond that's forming here and a bond that's forming here. So when we represent this final molecule, we have to draw the bond lines and the extra dots. So it would look like this, Br with a line bonded to sulfur with a line bonded to the other bromine. It does not matter if you did them, by the way, uh, straight across like this or at a right angle like this or something like that, as long as you have bromine bonded to a sulfur and then another bromine bonded off on the side, that's totally fine. And then the last thing that we need is all those extra electrons. We can't change the total number of electrons that are being represented in our drawing. Each bromine has seven to donate to the picture. Each sulfur has six to donate to the picture. So we should have a whole bunch of electrons in there um, by the time we're done. So there should be seven and seven and six. So seven and seven is 14, six more is 20. So if we look in our final drawing here, we should have 20 um, electrons represented. Two, four, six, that bond counts as eight. There's 10 and 12. There's 14, 16, 18, and 20. So that over there on the right would be a sulfur dibromide molecule. And again, that's how we represent covalent bonds. No brackets. We're not putting ions around these. They're not giving and taking. But we do have to show all the extra little dots that are out here. Yes, that is required. And then anything that's a bonded pair of electrons that's in between, we have to show that as a bond line. So there you go, representing different types of molecules. I don't expect you to, to be really great at drawing molecules yet. We're going to spend a bunch more time doing that. I just wanted to introduce that idea and kind of how we got there. So we kind of reviewed how to draw electron configurations and get valence electrons from them because it's the valence electrons that we use to draw these really simple Lewis diagrams. Lewis diagrams are just the symbol of the molecule with just um, you know some sort of a, a dot or two dots or three dots depending on the valence electrons. Because we can use valence electrons to figure out things like ion charges, whether it's going to give away one or two electrons, become a cation, or whether it's going to gain a couple of electrons and become an anion. Finally, we took a look at drawing ionic bonds with their square brackets, and then we looked at drawing some molecules with covalent bonds and covalent bond lines. There you have it. See you in class next time.